Elizabeth Lev is up next. But first, President Donald Trump and First Lady Melania lit the national Christmas tree on Wednesday. It's the 96th straight year for this presidential tradition. President Trump and the audience did a countdown, and Mrs. Trump hit the switch. The president also recited the nativity story, wishing all a Merry Christmas. And then he gave a shout out to one of the performance groups that this audience knows so well. Watch. That was the Dominican Sisters of Mary, Mother of the Eucharist. Their album, Yesu, Joy of Man's Desiring Christmas with the Dominican Sisters of Mary is available with the EWTN Religious Catalog online and at music stores everywhere. Nice touch to that tree lighting. My next guest is a noted art historian teaching Baroque, Christian, and Renaissance art at Duquesne University in Rome. She's also the author of the new book, How Catholic Art Saved the Faith, The Triumph of Beauty and Truth in Counter-Reformation Art. I'm thrilled to have with us here in studio to talk about it, Dr. Elizabeth Lev. Great to see you, Liz. Thank you so much so, for having me. So nice me. to see you here. I'm used to seeing you in museums and catacombs. So it's, I'm completely it's, out of context. That, that's okay. I, I like the painting off this, this is a wall. Good, the lighting is working well. Uh, tell me, why do you make the argument that Catholic art saved the faith? Did it need to be saved? I think, I think any student of the early 16th century, when we have uh, the famous event of Martin Luther's opening of the Reformation mm -hmm. in 1517, uh, would say that the church and the faithful found themselves in a state of complete chaos. Mm -hmm. So you have different religions that are all presented to you between Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, mm -hmm. um, and, and others. And what the real problem is, is the printing press. Think about the mm -hmm. increase in information. So you have millions of pamphlets that are just inundating the faithful and, or just the society. And these pamphlets, to get people's attention, they need a very kind of catchy type of title in writing, right? Mm. So what we would call today something like clickbait. A hook. A hook. And so they, they, they're very polemical. So you have a situation of different religions, tons of information about all these different religions, and the mm -hmm. faithful who, for the very first time, have to make choices. Mm -hmm. If it's been one holy Catholic and apostolic church forever, then today, or all of a sudden, it becomes the this, this sea of choices. Mm -hmm. So while the tone in print is very harsh and very polemical and very mm -hmm. yeah. you know, antagonistic, art becomes a great way to take the focus off the conflict with each other and to start looking together at one thing. So it becomes mm. not only didactic, right. but it's a great almost peacekeeper. It unites people. Mm -hmm. hmm. What lessons do we have to learn today, and can the church learn from 500-year-old pieces of art that happened during the Counter-Reformation? Are there lessons applicable to us here? The lessons of the, the, the 16th, 17th century art are, for the church, they're constants because the church is in, the, the works of art that the church commissioned in this period deal with sacraments. The teaching mm -hmm. on the sacraments, the, the sacraments are the same. Yeah. And so the representing of that teaching through art can certainly be helpful and, mm -hmm. and useful today. The idea of intercession, the presence of these uh, uh, patron saints, guardian angels, the, the existence of purgatory, all this visually reinforced mm -hmm. in the faithful. And then also the idea of how do we live out our faith in our contemporary life. It was a challenge in the 16th century, yeah. and it's a challenge in the 21st century. W would you, I mean, as I look out at American culture today, we are a non-literate age. We are really back in some ways to the stained glass and the great uh, uh, images and paintings that uh, swallowed up our forefathers. We're back there in some ways. The problem is, is the church producing artistic items and, and, and artistic works to draw the attention of that non-literate consumer, that non-literate former faithful. That contemporary art issue is a, is a very complicated one. There mm -hmm. is a great deal of hope for uh, contemporary art. There are a lot of great artists mm -hmm. that are out there producing really beautiful works. Where, what is, where there's a lot of willingness for artists to come to the fore, I often think the problem is patronage and public. Mm -hmm. And so while the public is illiterate today, if you will, yeah. in, in biblical questions, the public was, was not necessarily more literate in that yeah. period. So 
to, to explain this a little bit better, maybe the biblical stories were right. a lot more. They knew, you know, the, they, they knew, knew the basic knew the biblical stories. stories, and they knew mm -hmm. the stories of the saints because mm -hmm. they lived out the calendar in a way right. that obviously most people don't today. Mm -hmm. But really, when it came down to these essential questions of sacraments, I mean, that's part of what made the Reformation so powerful. Mm -hmm. No, this is not the body of Christ. Well, who's going to explain this to the faithful, and mm -hmm. how can the mm -hmm. faithful defend it and own that concept of the real presence? And so we have, um, we have, I think, a need to create a more demanding public, mm -hmm. a more sensitive public, and simply for more patronage. And, and not just, mm -hmm. you know, bishops have to commission more churches. Yeah. No, lay people need to put religious art in the home, I think. It's mm -hmm. part of our lives. Yeah, and, and, and the church has also lost its its taste, I hate to say, in so, in so many ways, not only in the liturgical setting, but beyond it. Let's talk about some of the things that really work. And this book, I have to say, this book is one of the most splendid depictions because as you are introducing us to things, it really is like visiting the Lislev Museum because <laughs> it's curated side by side. These pieces are put up against each other in a context. And I love that you also broaden this. It's not just painting. It's sculpture. It's architecture. And it broadens, I think, the understanding of the time and the impetus that drove these artists in that f f to face the challenge they were confronting at the time. And it teaches us a lot. Let's talk about the Church of the Jesu in Rome and how this was constructed with a particular aim in mind. You've already referenced it. Tell us what they achieved there and what was the purpose. Well, the Church of the Jesu is the very first church to be built in Rome after the Reformation, after the mm. sack of Rome, after Rome is really if you will, almost fall into its yeah. knees. So we have the Jesuit order that comes into play in the 1530s. Uh, the lay people, the church, are all very excited about these, these this, this group of young priests who are willing to go out and, and preach the faith and the mm -hmm. truth and uh, truth of the, the faith. Um, they want to help them, and they start to fund a church. And so Cardinal Alexander Farnese, who is the wealthiest cardinal in the College of the Cardinals, will pay for the church. And what makes this, this, this construction interesting is that the Jesuits and Cardinal Farnese were not always <laughs> getting the along. Page. The Jesuits are about, oh, no, we want austerity, we want simplicity. And Cardinal Farnese is like, no, make it bigger, put more gold gilding in. <laughs> and that the beauty of it is they work together to create a church that when you walk into the Jesu, you open up the door, which is relatively mm. low compared to the ceiling, and you, you, know, you, you catch your breath. Mm. And one of the... One of the main things about the church is a barrel vault ceiling, so it's got a very high mm -hmm. ceiling, and it makes something like a telescope, so your eye mm -hmm. focuses straight down the nave, and then it was the first church to be built without a rude screen. And I know you know this, mm -hmm. but just in case anybody mm -hmm. doesn't, yeah. I don't mean R-U-D-E, right. it's R-O-O-D. It's right. a screen that used to be put into churches mm -hmm. to separate lay people from, from, right. from, the, from the sanctuary. So they remove it. And so you walk in, the tabernacle's on the altar, there it is, the path to Jesus. Mm. And so this incredible construction, this, this, in a certain sense, battle between this religious order right. and this very worldly cardinal, which has such a happy ending. Because at the end of the day, Cardinal Farnese ended up with a personal conversion. He's buried in the Jesu. So mm -hmm. I like to say he built their church for them, but they saved his soul. They saved his soul, <laughs> yeah. And it is, and today you can still see it, it's spectacular. But I love how the art, and the architecture all serves the heart of why this is here and what it existed to do. And there's another story you tell so beautifully in the book, St. Charles Borromeo, which this is something I did not know. So there, there are a lot of hidden gems here, things we, take, we just take for granted. Uh, St. Charles Borromeo was the first, I guess, to construct confessionals in Milan. <laughs> and then tell us about how this catches on and some of the beautiful examples you point out in the book. Charles Borromeo, that, that multifaceted saint, you know, archbishop, treatise on architecture, mm -hmm. and he's, what he's really trying to do is to apply the Council of Trent, so this 20-year mm -hmm. council that the church has to address the problems uh, brought out in the refer during the Reformation. And again, confession is under attack as a sacrament. And confession is massively under attack. And so uh, the uh, confession and, and the Eucharist are the two that are the most attacked. And so he, he, he starts thinking about how to create a confessional that, first of all, is a purpose-built space. 
It's not we're going to go into a back room, which mm -hmm. helps to avoid scandals yes. with the clergy, which are very present in this period. Right. So he's thinking, how do I create a situation where we don't have scandalous situations? Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, something that's inviting. So here you are, there's the church, there's the confessional. Why don't I go to confession? Mm. And so he designs the confessional, which we see in Rome. I don't see them so much in the United States, but they're open on either side. Mm -hmm. So you kneel on either side, the priest goes, the confessor in the goes middle. in the middle, and the mm -hmm. screen's on. Yes. And he's closed off on both sides. Exactly. So it's, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's amazing all the things that came out of that period addressing very specific practical problems in a beautiful way. One of the things you talk about in the book, and you break it up into three sections, the sacraments, the inter intercession, and then the work of humans in salvation history. Um, you talk about the saints, St. Mary Magdalene particularly. Why does she become such a focal point in this period? We see her in so much art. You, you mentioned Reni's work, uh, Guido Reni, and, and others. Why did she become so important? So I, I've been I've been irritated about the portrayal of Mary Magdalene ever since the Da Vinci Code thing. Mm. So I've been sort of biding my time with this book <laughs> to be able to say, no, that's not who, who she, she is. is. Yeah. Mary Magdalene is a figure who's always been in art. She's she's mm -hmm. omnipresent in art. She's recognized. She she has more costume changes than your average <laughs> pop star. And she's you know one yeah. day she's the wealthy woman with the alabaster right. jar. She takes on a very very fundamental role. She is the poster child for confession. Mm. She really is the image of penitence. So she goes mm. from being, you know, swathed in these beautiful robes holding her jar mm -hmm. to the most dramatic person underneath in the crucifixion mm -hmm. later on. She becomes the one who's weeping the most. Yeah. She expresses our uncontrolled grief in a situation mm. like that. In the, in the counter-reformation era, she becomes the penitent, the woman who was beautiful, but the woman who eventually realizes all the things in this world don't matter as much as Christ. And mm. so she makes penance look good. Mm. Tell me for a moment about Caravaggio, one of my favorites, and, and you, it, to walk into those churches and to see Caravaggio's just hanging out on the wall near the, open, near the entryway of churches, unco uncovered, unguarded you you put a quarter in and the lights come on like a stadium which it's, you as it's, an art it's, it's gone up his, now it's more like you oh, know, two oh, bucks oh, in. okay two bucks <laughs> but still to put the to have that kind of light on on these irreplaceable images I, I i still scratch my head the conservationist in me says can we put this behind glass and in a museum tell me about the entombment that particular work and what caravaggio's contribution is he's only on the scene for what a decade Mm -hmm. He's his, his career basically he bursts on the scene. He has a little bit of work before mm -hmm. 1600, but he burst on the scene in in 1599, mm. which is on the eve of the jubilee year of 1600, and it's going to be the biggest jubilee since 1500 because the Reformation has right. caused Happened problems in, in the middle. So the church is preparing for an estimated three million pilgrims. Now, this is 1600. Mm. There are no buses, no trains, no airplanes. Mm. There are going to be three million pilgrims. They're going to be coming through the northern gate, which is the Piazza del Popolo, and they're going to be walking around the city and looking at different parts of the city. Mm. And so they bring all these artists in. And even this Caravaggio, this kind of, he doesn't paint like Raphael. He doesn't, mm. as a matter of fact, he never would have been successful if the Renaissance standards had continued. Caravaggio's art doesn't conform to what the other, yeah. you know, the perspective and the, the other mm -hmm. rules of painting. But when he makes these, these gritty images with this very powerful light, mm -hmm. it's, it's irresistible. So who notices him right after the Pope? The Oratorians. This amazing congregation founded by, by Philip Neri who understand that, 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 that faith is also delightful. So mm -hmm. they give us music and oratory and they want to give us paintings. Mm -hmm. And they commission this problematic in and out of jail yeah, he's artist. A, he's not exactly the, <laughs> he's, he, the, not exactly the cleanest record, <laughs> but we'll yeah. get into that another time. He, um, they commission him to do an altarpiece for their church where Philip Neri is buried, mm -hmm. uh, the Chiesa Nuova. And it's going to go on the on the right wall above an altar, and it's to show the entombment of Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's composed like no other painting before it. Usually entombments, no matter what you do in Renaissance painting, the way the viewer looks at things is he looks straight and then he looks up. This is mm -hmm. kind of the gesture of viewing. Mm -hmm. In the case of in the case of Caravaggio's entombment, the way the movement works is his incredibly dramatic light comes up and hits a female 
figure in the upper right hand mm -hmm. corner. And from that little dot of light, your eye starts to go down. So the first thing he's making you do, think about it physically, yeah. you're bowing right. as you get as you look at the painting. Mm -hmm. Then he puts this big, heavy, greenish, unwieldy body of Jesus that's just barely held up by his by his by his supporters. Mm -hmm. And then underneath it, he has a little piece of stone that seems to project into your space. So right. literally it's jutting in. Coming to you. And then underneath there's the altar with mm -hmm. a blank space in the middle. And at that time there were rules about painting. There actually were mm -hmm. rules. And one was no blank spaces in painting. Uh -huh. And yet Caravaggio not only leaves the blank space, but he has the hand of Jesus point to it. Like, hey, look, I left wow. a blank space in the painting. That space, its function is filled when the priest celebrated mass at the altar. Mm -hmm. When the priest stepped into that space, then that link between the body of Christ and the host and the was host. filled through the person of the, through the the priest in persona Christi. So you mm. have this beautiful way of reinforcing in the mind of the faithful, this is the body of Christ. That's what art yeah. can do. You can explain transubstantiation until mm. the cows come home, but mm -hmm. when when they see that. It's an instant it's, experience. Yeah. It's a sensate experience, which Caravaggio kind of, the grittiness, the realism of it always kind of grabs you by the throat and pulls you in and you can't stop looking. The first time I saw it, I thought, this is like stagecraft. This is a scene. I mean, mm -hmm. he, it's like a set. I, I hate to diminish it that way, but it practically is. It's a set for the mass. It's a particular, you know, a, a fantastic tableau. But what a scene. It's arresting when you see it in person. Ironically, he was always accused of being too realistic. But uh -huh. you're absolutely right. You, you are right. Uh -huh. You know, he may have the gritty, dirty feet here. Mm -hmm. He may have something that looks a little realistic there. Yeah. But the rest of it is completely staged. Yeah, yeah, and beautiful. Uh, tell me about the, I want to fast forward this to our own age. What can people get from this book? Why did you decide now was the time to write this? And then I have one last question. Um, this is this the idea of this book came to me in the lead up to 20 to 2017 which was the 500th anniversary mm -hmm. of the um, Protestant Reformation mm -hmm. and and I kept noticing that the way people talk to each other about sacraments the way we talk to each other about the faith should revealed a a lot of confusion so mm -hmm. there's not like this is how this is in the Catholic Church yeah. so how this is how we follow teaching this is how we follow teaching there was a lot of chaos and confusion and tones that were starting to get really very polemical mm -hmm. and, and 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 uncharitable and I was thinking to myself, you know, when this first happened, there was a solution that the church came up with, which was to create works of art that would reinforce the faithful in what they had been taught. Mm -hmm. But mostly, if you think about it, when we look at a work, I take people on tours all the time, yeah. groups that don't know each other. Sure. And I think one of the most beautiful things is they may be different sides of the political spectrum, different sides of religious mm -hmm. questions. But when we're looking at a work of art, we're all looking in the same direction. Mm. And so we're standing suddenly side by side yeah. before something we commonly agree on, which is beautiful. And mm. so it was a very, it was a way of kind of addressing these these modern problems and saying that, you know, once we could find solutions to talk to each other mm -hmm. that didn't involve name calling right. and I'm never speaking to you again. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's unifying. Humanity is unifying. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, true art pulls the best out of us. It reminds us of our humanity and the divinity that surrounds us if we're if we're open to it. Now, here's the challenge. As I read the book and I finished the book, I was elated by it. I was always also a little depressed by it because, and here's why I was depressed, not because of anything in the book, but because of what I see in the world. You go out and you look at contemporary art. I will put some images up for your <laughs> reflection. This is the contemporary church art. It's less than edifying. It's rarely beautiful, Liz, and it doesn't draw you in or pull you in. In fact, it repels in many ways. What lessons can we take from what you've unearthed and captured here? And might the lively arts, music, film, video, might that be part of whatever the next expression the church struggles to find or comes upon? I think you've hit the nail on the head. I, 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 there are plenty of, there's, first of all, there's plenty of bad Catholic art, painting, mm -hmm. sculpture, architecture. There's, there's some dreadful architecture out there. It is true. There are a few little pockets of very beautiful artists mm -hmm. who are doing yeah. very beautiful things. But you'll notice those pockets also, it's not just the artist. You require a very enlightened patron. You need yeah. someone who says, you know, I'm building this 
church and I would yeah. like to have this architect and I would mm -hmm. like to have mm -hmm. that artist and they're really thinking about things so there are things that are created that are that are beautiful so that's 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 the the one hand of it on the other hand the product production of all the bad art that I'm sure you'll mm -hmm. find plenty yeah. of <laughs> it's created a rift between the public and art Pe the public mm -hmm. doesn't really trust Catholic art anymore like what, what are you gonna it feels like you're, you're walking to a dentist's office yeah. what, what do you what what <laughs> what are you gonna do to me today felt banner and uh, sprinkles of uh, color with no purpose it just it's to the point where you just want they just want they roll their eyes into the back of their yeah. head and like you don't even want to argue about it anymore yeah. but you're right there are plenty of other arts that still have an excellent chance of mm -hmm. reaching mm -hmm. the faithful I think the faithful kind of shut down on on, on on painting and sculpture for the moment but the fact is there is between music and literature mm -hmm. and, and cinema there is there are loads and loads and loads of possibility where you have a public that's willing to mm -hmm. be informed to be enlightened to be yeah. uh, inspired yeah. by these art forms and then the fine arts as we call them will have to catch up yeah no well you see it you, and you see it in pockets I mean the, 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 the most vivid example would be Gibson's Passion of the Christ which as you know took so many of the images from Caravaggio yes. he borrowed wholesale some of those moments which I'm sure as you watched you, you saw all the the paintings flickering before your yes. eyes but uh, and I can remember him pouring over the sketches and the paintings and uh, he, he wanted he was he was trying to honor as well as advance his own image but it seems we're going to have to take this legacy and run with it in mm -hmm. some way and for too long Catholic art and art in general have ignored this maybe maybe it's time for a comeback we shall I, see. I'm hoping for a revival. Well, you're certainly a big part of it. Liz Lepp, thank, thank you for being you. here. How Catholic Art Saved the Faith, The Triumph of Beauty, and the Truth in Counter-Reformation Art by Elizabeth Lepp is available now in bookstores everywhere and online.